questions, and I'm sure that uh, you'll answer most of them uh, afterwards. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. So um, thanks for coming along. Uh, just a bit of background about me uh, to explain how I arrived in the music business. I'm, by training, if you like, I'm a musician. And um, in 1999, uh, I had a brilliant idea with a bunch of other people uh, in the first dot-com bubble to start up a niche music download company. And what we did is we licensed music from all over the globe, all, globe, all over, very niche, and I mean very niche, quite obscure some of the music. Um, and we got that data and we gave it to uh, someone that could make it available to the public. So we didn't actually make it available to the public. Uh, we were backed by FreeServe uh, and various private equity uh, investors. And that was the start of a very interesting journey because before that time, I did not really know how to use a computer. Uh, now, at any point in this talk, if I start jabbering or shaking, it's because I've got PTSD because of what I had to go through on the learning curve of getting where I am today. I have to say it was the most incredible journey. It was the most amazing learning uh, experience uh, in terms of the people I work with, the types of teams I work with, um, and my exposure to uh, all sorts of uh, markets from China to Russia to UK to the US, you name it. Um, and it's been a really amazing experience. And so what I want to do is just explain a bit about how if you look at something like iTunes or Spotify, how, how much work goes into the back end of making that work, and, and who the culprits are uh, who are trying to kind of trip you up all the way along that journey. And you'd be quite surprised. You'd think they'd help, but sometimes they don't. They hinder. So I ended up moving to the company that stored our music uh, to make available to the public. And the company I moved to is a company f founded by Peter Gabriel that was called On Demand Distribution, or OD2, as we called it, 2Ds, OD2. And that company built a white label platform that allowed us to brand up a music download store in, to start with for any customer that paid the license fee. We handled all the music licensing, all the back end processes, all the ingestion of the content, uh, all of the transcoding and encoding, all the, that kind of stuff. Um, and then the idea was that they then got their teams to brand up the front end and run the music services. So that was a big gap in understanding because the first thing they realized is no one knew how to do it. They didn't really have any documentation um, and no one was really interested in the process of what we call retailing or merchandising the music. So. I started there, and I started with one designer hand-coding HTML pages. I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but we did. Hand-coding HTML pages. The kind of clients we had were everyone from Microsoft, Coke, uh, all the major ISPs across Europe. Uh, and we branded up their music stores, and we ran them for them. And to start with, it was a very slow, very painful business. We were the first properly legal music download services, so we had the backing of the record labels. Some of the clients we had, as I've mentioned, were very, very big. They were also very supportive because it was nascent, a nascent industry, if you like. It was the first time that they had really gone into the digital download market or digital music. Um, properly legal, not Napster, uh, not mp3.com, which was, frankly, not serious. Um, and I was really passionate about music. Having a musical background, I'm a musician, play lots of instruments, I've done lots of music, really passionate about music, really passionate about taking what I knew and turning it into something that I hoped people might like. And after a while, the first thing I learned was to disassociate myself from that passion and become objective. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. So I ended up doing content management the editorial, many times on a Friday, I wrote all the reviews myself. A lot of the development, my own content management uh, teams. Uh, working on the search platform. Uh, DSP eventually when I went to Nokia, which is digital signal processing. So analyzing music files to do stuff. Master data management, I'll get onto that in a minute. Data cleaning, optimization, the taxonomy and ontology, personalization, recommendations, and contextual relevance. Once you've moved to Nokia, of course, go mobile. Once you go mobile, you've got contextual relevance to play with if you want to. All of it driven by data. 
Uh, all of it means you have to manage a lot of data coming in and manage a lot of data coming, going out and back into the system from consumers. So I was, I was really trying to get to the point where I could be objective, and then I read a book. Has anyone called, heard of W. Edwards Deming? No one's heard of W. Edwards Deming. Okay. So Six Sigma, you have. Yeah. Six, yeah. Six Sigma, all of that, uh, just in time, all came out of a lot of his work in the 1950s when he went to Japan and lectured there. He was a statistician, a professor of statistics, mathematics. Um, was a robot. The way he talked was, and wrote was like a robot. He was just all about statistics. He was all about control. So having things within statistical lines of control where things that you thought were good were bad, and where things that you thought were bad were equally as bad as the thing you thought that was good, if it was an outlier and wasn't within the line of statistical control. So I read that book and I thought, right, okay. We have these processes, and I'm going to go through some of those in a minute, that need looking at with that frame of mind to be objective. Um, and really, that was, my, my, that, that was what kicked me off into getting much, much deeper into the data and less on the music side. Uh, and once I did that, uh, I have to say, understanding the way you can develop software and products, uh, working out where the value is in, uh, in data, wherever it's from, uh, was when I really started to, to un understand that. Um, and the first thing was to realize that actually digital music is just like any other supply chain. It's a digital supply chain, but it's a supply chain. You have exactly the same life cycle. You get the products from the supplier. They come in. They go into your warehouse, okay, your back end. Okay, you put them up on the shelves in the front of house, pages. Uh, you sell them. They have a very short life cycle when it comes to music because typically after four weeks, the sales dip. People's interest moves on as the releases come out week by week. Um, and you then have to uh, analyze that. You have to know what's going on. You have to have analytics in place to see what your consumers are doing or what your shoppers are doing. Um, and you have to think of ways of upselling or cross-selling um, and making sure that you're getting as much basket value as you possibly can from each consumer. We are talking now about downloads. Um, in the actual process from the back-end perspective, really, uh, the job was to take XML files, which gave you all the details. It told you the territories the products were available in. Uh, it told you the price they should be made available at. It told you the metadata told you, uh, you know, the artists and the title and uh, all the tracks and all that sort of stuff. Um, so we took that data in along with the files. We had to store the files, transcode them, encode them. So we got them in one format. We had to put DRM on it. So we had a process that put DRM on it. After a while, we had to take it off because they wanted us to take it off. We had to do what the rights holders did, and they were the kings. Um, metadata management, again, I'll come on to that in a minute. You've got an awful lot of metadata and uh, an awful lot of people and an awful lot of stores, and especially when you go into different countries, that have a different view on what something should be. Totally different view. Go to China. In fact, don't go to China. Give it to Chinese people to do. So digital asset management, we had all sorts of documents that came with things, PDFs, uh, richer files. We didn't necessarily use them, but we still had to, to manage them. Entity management, taxonomy, ontology, third-party data, and content management. So um, anyone guess how much of the catalog was consumed? The, the music service at Nokia now has uh, over 30 million tracks, about 35, 37 million globally available to all, all the services. But like almost any other uh, industry, any other uh, in inventory, only 20% of that catalog ever got touched. So the good thing here, the first thing I thought was, right, well, I know what my priorities are in terms of fixing things and making things better. Um, and there's a question here, which perhaps we can talk about at the end. We'll come back to it. Is can you convince people to listen to music released in their country that no one bought? That's this stuff. Problems, some of the problems. If you, if you know the way the industry works, and you might not, you might not. If you have a major label in the United States of America with an artist, let's say Beyonce, what they do is they say Universal or Sony or whatever, Germany, you, you can look after that artist in your territory and we'll ship you the master files 
and you'll create your own files to give to the DSP, the digital service provider. And you can also put your own metadata in. So they've got their own data entry systems with people putting in the name of the artist. And in Germany, they remembered the Germans are quite accurate. They remembered to put the EQ on the end, but they didn't put nulls. In Turkey, they put the bounce nulls without the EQ, but they put the nulls. In the US, they got it right. And in other territories, there are many versions of Beyonce, I can tell you, Miss Knowles, Miss Knowles, all sorts of things. Now, the problem with that is, in a system where you're in an industry where you do not have a common artist identifier, okay, there is nothing that says one, two, three, four, five equals Beyonce Knowles. So in the artist identifier field, if you see that, you know to put whatever you want to represent Beyonce Knowles as in the system. This way, we string match. It's just the data coming in and you're string matching. So every single time you get a new version of Beyonce, you get a duplicate artist. And that might not sound like a real problem to you, except when you realize you've got 30 million artists, well, not 30 million artists, over 30 million tracks and an awful lot of artists, and there are problems in the way you can then search for that and display that information. The same happened with Steve Ray Vaughan, et cetera. Now, Yes. You can, but that process takes time. I, I've, been work, I've, I've been working on the one at Hartree, actually, the Hartree supercomputer for another project, and it's nice to have that many cores. But anyway, you're right. You're right. I'll come on to, I'll come on to DSP in a minute. So you think, well, OK, what's the, implica implica the impact of duplicate artists? Well, uh, this is where you start to get a bit nerdy with this. Jay-Z featuring, OK, actually, well, that's, that's a single string. That's, that's represented as a single artist because it's just a string, and it's different to all the other Jay-Z strings. But it's not. The primary artist is Jay-Z, and the secondary artist is whoever these people are. But we didn't have the time, resources, uh, because of what we had to do uh, in, in terms of pushing the startup, the OD2 startup. We didn't have time to get that kind of stuff right. And um, so we had to come up with ways of fixing that uh, in, in a different way. It has a huge impact on the way you report. And when I say report, I don't just mean back to the labels, because you have to report what you've sold and give them the money, and the publishers because rights holders and publishers are two different people. They're both rights holders, but the labels and the publishers are different people. But if you report to the charts, the official charts in the UK and France, and like I did, all the other territories, then if you've got Johnny Halliday, and here's a good example of a different problem, same issue, Johnny Halliday, that's known as Halliday, Johnny, is file as. So they couldn't quite decide at the time whether they should send one or the other, and they, they, different people sent different versions. But what happens is, is he actually shows, because they're only counting that many sales, lower down the chart than if you add that number and that number up, he should end up here. So it has a big impact on the artist. It has a big impact on their marketing campaigns and the exposure that their artists get. So you have to try and get it right. And it's... Their fault. The, the labels sent this stuff in like that. The rights holders sent the stuff in like that. The same artist, remember, Elvis, for example, is everywhere. Lots and lots of right hold, rights holders have got Elvis. PRS do the same thing I did, which I'll come on to that in a minute, which is to use a bit of cleverness to try and get to at least 80%. If you, if you uh, in my experience of PRS in the past, I'm saying this on the camera now, uh, is you know, there is a certain pot that they manage uh, which is difficult for them to identify who the person is. I mean, it's sitting there in a scroll, that's absolutely fine. Someone will get it one day. But they can only do what they can do, and we could only do what we could do, bearing in mind the resources that we had available. So I... I thought, and I thought, and I thought. Now, at this point, I've moved from OD2, and we got bought by Nokia. Now, Nokia, the good thing about Nokia is one thing they were not short of was resources. They also had a BI division 
that were throwing themselves at you to help you with relationships with people, uh, consultants who are experts in data, data, uh, master data management, data quality. Um, and uh, so what we did was we sat down and worked out that we needed a proper piece of kit to analyze the catalog. And you can see here in our first process, and I'll go through the process in a minute, it indicated that 21.5% of the catalog was duplicate artists. Well, that's a lot. That's an awful lot. Bearing in mind the effect it has when you search for a string, you get what you see, because our search results are based on sales. We pushed up on autocomplete or predictive search, whatever you want to call it. We pushed up the things that were selling, but it meant that if you got Beyonce Knowles within the acute, you click on that, the other catalog that was attached to her other representations wasn't there. That would drive users away. They'd think they haven't got the stuff I like. So you've got this potentially a leakier bucket than you would normally have of users, just simply because they don't think you've got the content that you should have. But for this, we used a, a brilliant tool called, uh, uh, from the Infosphere uh, suite of products that IBM have called Quality Stage. Uh, how many very techie people are there here? Quite techie. All of you? Yeah? Well, it tokenized the data, picked it apart, rescored it, and then gave you a, a set of candidate duplicates, basically. And you could, you could adapt the algorithms, and there were many of them, in an interface to actually get the score as high as you possibly could uh, and, and, and tweak it. We ended up with 37 versions of Mozart, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the interesting thing about this was it's great. So here's a good example. It seems very simple. Brian Kellett Trio. It is actually the Brian Kellett Trio. Um, and in the end, what we realized we had to do was to create, very simple, an aliasing tool that said for all the representations that are duplicates, we'll alias them to what we say is the right thing. Now, the next time they come in, they'll automatically map to the right artist. But the problem is that you can't do that automatically because James and James, two separate bands, okay, or two separate artists, you don't know whether they're the same band or not. If one's from France and one's from America, you have to sit down. And so every single thing we did had to be a clerical review. So I had a team of musicologists uh, and data experts who sat and look, got post insert, if you like, into the database, took all this stuff out, prioritized it by sales, remember the 20%, uh, looked at that and then started to fix it, put it in the aliasing tool or whatever. So that's, that's actually the content that was coming from the labels. In the old days, in a CD store, uh, the box of CDs every week came in from the record companies and there are a bunch of really passionate people, like I was, who took those things out and decided where they should sit where they should sit in the shop, what genres, what subgenres, uh, whether it was file as or known as. So is it the, the Brian Kellett Trio or Brian Kellett Trio The? Actually, it's Brian Kellett Trio The when you're putting it under an A to Z system. You put it under B. So that's great in, in the CD world, and that's what they'd always been used to. And when they moved to digital, they kept the same mindset. The problem was it has a huge impact when you've got thousands and thousands and 10,000 albums coming through the door every week. So that was an interesting process. And you know what? It's still not right. And absolutely no one gets it right. The ones, the ones that get it right with a very limited cap catalog tend to be dance, electronic music, right down to the primary artist, secondary artist. If you look on the interfaces they have, you can click on the primary artist and click on the secondary artist. Um, and that's because they care um, and because they, uh, you know, they have the time to manage it. They don't have a million tracks coming through every six months or every five months. So that was quite interesting. It, you know, the, the, the problem kind of represents itself to me. Uh, if I was a supermarket and I had an order picking system and no one would accept this in a supermarket, okay, and I said, get, get me the meat because I want it to go on the shelf, and I want this automatic order picking system to do that work for me, that would be absolutely great. Well, in the real world, if it did that and brought you that, you'd be pretty annoyed. 
Okay? And that's exactly what it's like at scale in music. So we invested a lot of time working out how to fix those things and always driven by sales because we, we knew we could never do all of it. It was a bit like having your fingers in the dike. Um, but we, we managed to, to clean up an awful lot of things and really dramatically change the way we reported to the chart companies and lessen the work that they did. You talked about PRS. They have to do the same stuff as well. But if they don't have to because we've done it for them and fixed it for them, it means right the way down the chain they're happy. The labels are also happy. The rights holders are happy because we've exposed their artists to more people. We've got more sales opportunities um, for the artists. Yes. Why did you set up a registry giving unique identifiers to artists? So, the community has done that. In the end, what tends to happen, what has happened, is an outfit called, called Music Brains, which is a, a, a nerd community <laughs> of, of music fans, has set up uh, and continued with, and this is the trick, is there have been lots of communities that have popped up and then eventually the interest in those has waned. Uh, music Brains, so far as I know, and I stopped doing this two years ago, so it may have died, but so far as I know, most of the people that I have been involved with in the industry have moved to using Music Brains. Not necessarily the labels, but at least, um, at least if everyone's going to be uh, using something in the future, then there is a place they can go to get that. In terms of the kind of the structure of the data that we receive, the literal structure, technical structure, there are things like DDEX now which are great because it means that everyone is sending the same structure of XML in. To each DSP, it means that we've all got one representation of things. It's taken them a while to move and some of the major labels haven't wanted to move over, but I think they probably all have now. Certainly, you have to remember you've got major labels, small labels, indies, aggregators, all of whom have their own idea about how to do things, which is why you end up in a huge, great big mess. It's fine with a CD, and it's fine with a shop. When you go digital, it's a nightmare. But anyway, that's, that's what we did uh, for, and they're still doing it, the team, uh, to, to try and, and <laughs> clean, um, to clean the, uh, the, the data uh, from an artist's perspective. One thing I think I had back at the beginning that I didn't mention was um, there are two models, and it's important that we understand that the difference in how you manage content um, is there's ownership, which is where you get a download, it's a file, you, put it, you download it to your PC or your phone and you own it. And there's access, which is your new st the streaming services, Spotify, etc., which you, I'm sure, all use, or other ones. Um, we were doing streaming back in 2004. There is nothing new that anyone is doing now that we haven't already done before. Uh, they might be doing it better, they, you know, they, might, uh, they might have a better back end, they might have um, uh, more coverage, etc. Uh, but the same stuff has gone around and round and round. So, uh, there we go. Taxonomy. As if that wasn't bad enough. So people with their own representation of how an artist should be spelled based on the fact that they might have not been able to find the E acute on a keyboard, or an umlaut or something else, is you then come on to a very, very subjective area, which is genres and subgenres. Uh, if you go to Finland, I can tell you they have their own version of rock. I love the Finns, they're amazing people, but they really do have their own descriptions of what rock are, and they're passionate about it, and it's very deep. They've got a lot of subgenres, all of it very loud. And um, I, w I would travel on, on trains and, and travel around and let me, older ladies, uh, you know, 65 plus would have headphones in on a, and when they took them off, it would be uh, you know, pretty aggressive uh, math metal or something else. This is incredible. They all, they all love their rock, which is why they put Lordy into the um, uh, Eurovision Song Contest. So numbers again. We, this is a long time ago. We had 5,633 genres that people had sent us. 5,633. And we got 250 new expressions of a genre okay, per week. We couldn't send out a sheet to everyone and say, 
this is what you have to call it, and here's how you define it. Because again, everyone's got a different view of what things should be called. So again, we had a, a, a process where we defined the truth as we saw it, uh, in terms of genres, not subgenres necessarily. We didn't actually show subgenres. And uh, we had our own, own versions. As I say, you can see there are all these different, and they are, these are all valid actually, these are, these are valid, but we had everything from bubblegum pop to pink music to, well, what is it, you know, what do you, so you have, you have to listen to it. If the artist hasn't sold anything, it goes to the bottom of the pile. But at that rate, um, you, again, you, there were two people who were taking this stuff out every, every time, every week, and going through it, and a lot of it is logical, and you could do it fairly quickly, but some of it you had to go, I have no idea what that is at all, you have to go and listen to it. So we all had very, very nice headphones, because the last thing I wanted to do is to be sued by someone who said I had to listen to 18 hours of Schlager, and, uh, and it's just done my head in and my ears have broken. Schlager, okay, that's a joke I can tell you later, but anyway. So with that many pieces of information coming in, we had to have processes that, that cope with that as well. And we did, we had lovely processes. Um, but at the end of the day, we had a taxonomy tool. At the end of the day, there was no um, uh, replacement for people, these people, or musicologists in this case, people who actually understood what music was. And we had to contain our version of what the truth was, even against the people that worked in the building who would come up and argue that something wasn't one genre, it was another genre or a subgenre. We had to say, whatever, but this is our version of what it is. You call it what you like. Otherwise, we just simply can't manage it. Yes. Yeah. So. The fact that Elvis is in you know, 60, 80, 100, 150 uh, rights holders catalogues because the, it's been licensed so many times to people, individual songs, whole albums. Uh, it just, it's crazy, the amount of information that goes out. And then Elvis will come in as all sorts of things. He's pop, he's rock, he's rockabilly. He's, and actually, he is, you could argue. He's been all of those things. That's the problem with people that have been around a long time, is they do change within their genre typically. People, I have to say, people don't generally move out of their genre. It's quite rare. Um, but, you know, it, you could argue that they have been all those subgenres. Uh, but, you know, you, we still have to have a version of the truth. So, um, again, we had, if you like, an aliasing system that said, when it comes in again, that artist with a genre, this is what we say it is. So, that's a job for a ca the catalogue team. We had a scrum team for the catalogue and a scrum team for search. We ran agile processes, by the way, for anyone that understands software development life cycle. And um, that team, you know, they were snowed the whole time, always busy. There were always all sorts of things they had to do. And we had to, we had to push for time to get their time as well. So we might get two weeks out of, out of 20 for them to do this stuff. So we'd always have to wait to fix it, at which point the, the problem's growing and growing and growing and growing and then they fix it and then we can do something about it. Or they fix it and we find there's a bug and it's actually thrown everything out and made it even worse. And that actually happened quite a few times as well. That's software for you, but you know. So I think the one thing I learned again is if you have control in the back end, that, that, that makes me really happy. That makes me so happy. So a genre and subgenres and all nicely ordered. And um, the effect that data, the bad data had, or the good data, the, the effect that good data has and good data processes and good management processes uh, had, or it, it meant a better user experience. When you search for Beyonce, you got Beyonce and you got all of her catalog. Uh, and as a user, as a business, we were happy because they didn't disappear and go to another uh, digital music service and, uh, and buy the products from them. They stayed with us because they could find the music they want. Flexibility on the front, flexibility on front end design. The product teams and the UX teams could say, this is great, we have really well ordered data. That means that we can actually build the front end like this. We know it's gonna be good. We know the data's gonna be good. We're not gonna end up with anomalies. Um, and so it gave them greater flexibility of how they design the front end. The product benefited as well as the user. The ability to localize per country. It's crit it was, that's critical, I'll come on to that next slide. The ability to localize per country is really important when you're in more than one country. Automation and efficiency. 
It meant that if you know who is who, and you have good sales information and good charts and good information about what's actually rank-wise sold, you can actually auto-populate pages, you can auto-generate charts, you can do things that normally take time and take manual processes. That requires less resource, less headcount, process is more efficient, you can put more content out for less resource up front. So from a, a, a front-end design thing, as I say, you can do faceted browsing, more pages, subgenre specific new releases. We had RSS feeds that went to people's browsers that told them what the new releases were. Subgenre specific charts, important in Finland and with dance. And more choice for everyone, absolutely everyone, had more choice about what they could do. So it was really, it was really, really important to get that control. And it took probably three years to get complete control over the processes that we knew we could manage with the resources that we had available to us. I'll try and explain. One of the problems, remember I said about localization of the service? One of the problems with going to a place like Asia is I can't read it. Oh, I have no idea what it says. Also, Britney Spears in, I think it was China, is known as Little Flower, not Britney Spears. She's actually got two names, so she's got her official name, and she's known as Little Flower. So I can tell you what we did in China. We said, Chinese people, <laughs> that's all yours. You get a partner to do that for you. You run that whole process. And they had access to tools to do things themselves. But one of the things we had to be able to do was to reflect that taxonomy in a relevant way for each country. China, Finland, France especially. Um, whichever country, they all had their own way that they wanted to do things. If you didn't give them the opportunity to structure it the way they wanted, actually, it would have damaged the experience, it would have damaged the sales, it would have damaged the business. Uh, we wouldn't have had people coming to, to download the, the music. So in the end, the answer is, what, what's the answer? I showed this to the architects. I said, this is what I want. I want the ability to take any of these entities, these product types, I want to be able to push them wherever I like. Assamese music, go into regional, India. If I want to, I want to put it through France. I don't care. That's not, my, that's not my bag. I want it so flexible that anyone can draw these lines through that stack, the channel, subgenre, genre, country, and language so that the representation is exactly as they want it, and all we have to do is give them the tool to build it. And the way we did that in the back end was to just simply make the taxonomy flat, completely flat, and every single territory had a virtual taxonomy. And they came in with a, with a team, and they sat down, and we said, off you go. We still got our version of the truth, so we're happy, because we still got to manage things even if they don't think they're right. But at the same time, it gave the teams the flexibility to represent the music whichever way they wanted to. Uh, and that's, it's, it's critically important. It's important for uh, Sweden that their schlager, schlager is kind of like James Last. If you've ever heard of James Last, that's kind of schlager. So, um, and, uh, and, and Norway's got their own version. Germany's got its own version. So umpar music is a version of schlager as well. And uh, it meant that the teams were happy. It was absolutely fantastic. And the architects got this, and they went away, and they built this system that allowed each territory to build a virtual taxonomy. There were problems with places like India, where in the north, they don't do the same as they do in the south. So, but that's an anomaly for us, and we didn't go any further than that. But in North India, you wouldn't play them South Indian music, and South Indian music, you wouldn't play them North Indian music. Um, that was a different matter. But really, we covered most of the globe by being able to do this. Um, and it was a powerful um, relationship builder with teams who were remote. And I don't know if anyone's operated in an organization where you've got a big central team who have an opinion, a very loud opinion, and access to all the resources and all the management team, uh, and are able to push all the decisions in that you want to get done. And you've got these people out in the territories feeling all alone. There's only four of them in the team. And, they're, and then they're fighting their own battles to try and win in their own territory. Um, this is a great relationship builder. Give them the control. They're the experts. And China, actually, and India were cases in point. I haven't got a clue. India, a bit. China, 
the rest of Asia. No idea at all. I mean, as I say, I can't even read it. And I don't want to listen to Chinese opera through those ex expensive headphones or not, but I don't. So here we go. We've got a wonderful system, fully automated, 24-7, high volume. You can't hire enough people to do all the stuff you want to do. Uh, you can fix it using some, some automation. Um, even then, you start, still can't fix all of the errors. The labels don't think it's their problem. It ruins user experience. It results in loss of sales, increases headcount requirements, and it makes it very hard to engage users if you don't manage it properly and they can't see what they want to see. And that was just the users who were going to suffer. Yes. Folksonomy. Yeah, we thought about that. That's another resource that we didn't get the opportunity to uh, try. But yes, you could use that. Now, the good thing about that is you can use statistics again to work out what's true. Because if 99 people say that is this, and one person says, no, it's not, it's that, you go with the 99, right? It's crowdsourcing um, and very nice too. But um, no, we didn't quite get there. Last FM, yes, and Last FM, and I'll come on to that when I do recommendations, because I also looked after the recommendations engine and developed that. Uh, yeah, it, a lot of it's driven, by, it's driven by tags, and the tags can be totally freeform, semantic tags, you know, uh, like Black Knight music and et cetera, et cetera. But at scale, if that's got validity statistically, you can actually use that to, to, to drive um, playlists and, well, exactly what Last FM did, does did. Uh, they've kind of, they've been on a downward curve recently, which is a shame. And I do know, uh, I met quite a few of the guys at Last FM and respected them a lot, actually. I did, I, I thought they had a great product. So, so that back end processes, relationships with all the uh, teams out in the countries. I think we were up at 50 territories, Russia, I mean, all of Europe, a lot of Asia, uh, Russia, South America, North America. Um, so it was a, a, a lot of countries, and we had, at that point, we had a la carte, so you go in, pay 99p, get a download, all you can eat, you buy a Nokia phone, you get all the music you want for a year, then you can keep it. That was a great offer, actually. Um, shame about the marketing, but it would have been good if it worked. Um, uh, it was fantastic, so a very different model, and again, it's, it's important, I'll come on to this with the recommendations, it's important there, there is a huge difference in the way people interact with content when you've got those particular models. It's the same as streaming in a way, is where you don't have a cost every time you hit something and, and do it. You interact totally differently with a catalog. So for example, a normal person would listen to typically three genres of music. That's what most people listen to. If you go into something like All You Can Eat um, uh, packages or streaming packages, they tend to range across seven, eight. So they get exposed to a lot more. I mean, they're at the kind of the smaller end of the percentages of their total listening, but they do, there's no risk. They can try stuff. So it is important to know that they do, they can try stuff. If there's no cost, they will. Um, and then we came on to, I, I, I'm not going to dwell too much on this because it, just rethinking about this, uh, it hurt my head. Um, so content management in, let me see, 2003, so we're hand coding pages uh, and putting them up on the system. And I'm going, uh, this just cannot be real. We, th there's no way that we have to do this. We must be able to get a content management system that we can buy or get off the shelf or part develop um, to do this job. And we had a consultant come in and he talked to us all and he said, no, there just isn't one that does that job. So I thought and I thought and I thought, and I got some development, external development resource who had worked for us. This was at OD2. And I, I thought, right, okay, well, I, I have an idea about how we can develop this system. And, uh, and I did, and we developed a, a content management system. And it, my rationale was driven by a number of things. One of them was because we didn't have really robust analytics in place, a reductive process of understanding how much content was bought through search and how much was bought from these editorial pages we were investing a huge amount of time in. Search box is cheap, all right? Lots of people in lots of places is a lot of money. 
And when I analyzed it, I realized that 2.3% of our sales were coming from the editorial pages and 97.7% of sales were coming through search. And the problem was that in terms of headcount, is that is what we put and allocated to each of those particular sales channels. So I thought, well, what do we have to do? So I'm going back to Deming here, statistical control, getting processes that mean that the same thing happens every single time. And uh, this is where you don't build relationships, good relationships with the teams, because every single one of them has an idea about what they want to do. Some of them want to get XML by making SOAP queries and getting the catalog numbers back and then building their own XML and then sticking it up. And they build their own little content management systems because they, they do a bit of development. Um, but it's not, it, that's no way to run a business. And I convinced the management team and we got some money to build this content management system. And I'm not going to go into a great detail, but it was quite cool. Because what it did is it understood the rank of artists in each territory, what's important. If something comes in by an artist that has sold in the past, it's going to go in the bucket to go in the store. And in the end, we could do all the catalog search, verification, publishing configuration, partner configuration, template management, publishing scheduler. So you could publish something in three weeks' time if you wanted to. It's absolutely fine. You could just set it up to come on a diary. The reporting told you the publishing history, the territorial filtering, the rights holder reporting. I should look here, shouldn't I? Uh, and every single time it went through a stage of the process, the database got polled with all the content that was in that particular template to be turned into an HTML page and put up on the, on the platform. And the reason it had to do that is because at any given point in time, a label would come in and send you a takedown because they'd sold the rights to an artist or a product to someone else. So we had to keep validating right the way through the process. And um, that, that was a real, a real bonus. Uh, in the end, what we got to was a process where for the files that we trusted, for the, comp for the processes that we trusted, if a change came up, it notified the system, it unlocked the page, content from the bucket dropped in the template, produced another HTML page, and that, that content came out of the store so it couldn't be bought. So you wouldn't end up with an error an errored image or an error file on the, the, the page of the service. Um, of course, what it meant was everyone had to work the same way. And I have to say there, I learned a little bit about possibly how to help people get over that issue, how uh, training is important, and how reaching out and taking requirements uh, is also important from all of the people, even if you end up implementing your own it's important to get people involved in the process. So I must say, I learned an awful lot there, but it worked and it got the job done. We went down from weekly publishing cycles, we could do hourly publishing cycles. So, and the charts also populated because they were just charts. So the system went every day, thank you very much, new chart, job done. The system reported every 24 hours. So that was, that was fascinating. That was my first, I'm building some software and putting the requirements together for it. And uh, I really enjoyed that process. And it was a good bit of kit. And in the end, um, actually, Nokia used, ended up using um, Documentum. Anyone heard of Documentum? No, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's like having the Battlestar Galactica to go and get milk from Tesco. It is. It's just bonkers. And the amount of stuff you couldn't do with it, and it went back from being what I would say a bulk population process, it went up to people having to put things in one by one. I was like, okay, well, it's, it's not my problem anymore, someone else's problem. So I think that also taught me, you know, horses for courses. But I think Nokia had global licenses for this, so that's what they used. Um, but in my, in my opinion, it was a backward step. Recommendations. You've all used Amazon. If you like this, you'll also like any mathematicians in here. I'm not going to put your hand up, are you? Yeah, yeah, go on, put it up. So, uh, at one point in time, don't know what the numbers are now, 40% of Amazon sales came through recommendations. 40%, that's a lot. In an a la carte scenario, not streaming, not all you can eat, but where one click equals money, 
another click for the same amount of money is a 100% increase in basket value. All you have to do to double your revenue, therefore, is sell one more thing that people might like. And Peter Gabriel also started another company, and they were called originally Xavier, they're now called The Filter. And they had uh, mathematicians, really, developers, mathematicians, who used Bayes, Bayesian maths, probability, really hurts my head when I think about the A, B, equals it, it is very confusing, um, to predict, just like Amazon do, what it is you would like to buy if you have clicked on one particular thing or you are looking at a particular item. And what was amazing was how amazing it was. It was just so accurate when you looked at it from a music perspective. I was a muso, so I look at that and go, poof, okay, that's incredibly accurate. And yes, I like that. And you're right, this is exactly the same ballpark as the thing I'm looking at. So if I don't have it, I'll get it. And this is actually a, a screening of, uh, of the music service at Nokia for Pink Floyd. We got Roger Waters was the first recommendation. That's not bad. This is abstract. It's a catalog number. It's everyone's catalog, each user. Okay, aggregated. They take the catalog number and the sales number, and then they use Bayes and probability to predict what you're going to like. So does anyone know Pink Floyd? You do? Okay, Roger Waters. Yes. Deep Purple, pretty good. Genesis, well, here we go. I can't even see who that is. The Who, Peter Gabriel. You know, it's all the same ballpark. It's all the right thing. So it's really important that uh, you've got these in an anacart situation. As I said, 40% of Amazon sales at one point in time, I'm not sure what it is now, was, were driven by these recommendations. Um, when you have multiple product types, you can do it across product types. So on Amazon, again, it doesn't have to be the same type of thing you're looking at. It can be something completely different. But people that bought this set of pair of gloves also like that riding crop. Goodness knows what. Whatever it is. But you know what? They're probably right, and they probably make an awful lot of money off that. And I know that from, from, the, uh, from the analysis we did of this, it made a huge difference. Again, people on a mobile phone actually used it to navigate. Because a mobile, they're good now, but right back when mobile started and we first went onto mobile, it wasn't quite as easy to navigate around a store. It wasn't such a slick user experience. And uh, people would actually use it to navigate around. And you could just see them go, buy, 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 buy. Thank you very much. Buy. I'm off. They'd come back again and do the same thing, search for something that they like, and then go and get all the associated recommendations. So basket value went up a lot. It wasn't just 100%. You're talking four, five, six hundred 600%, which is a huge amount. We also found some interesting problems in this. If you look at Bayes, what you get is a probability S-curve. So let's say, I'll talk about that in a minute, let's say that's uh, mega death at the top, Okay, that will end up as Engelbert Humperdinck. It just will. That's the way it works. Okay, it's probability. It gets less as you go down the S curve. Um, it's not a long tail. Different thing. So the stuff that you saw back there, the yes, the Genesis, the Peter Gabriel, is the stuff right at the top of there. But the problem is, is when you have hugely popular, hugely popular artists like Dido, or Robbie Williams, okay, Angels, tracks like that. What happens is every recommendation that you give has Dido or Robbie Williams in it. And so what we had to do is to take the very top of that S-curve and just hack it, hack it off, just flatten it down, flatten it out. Because otherwise what you'd, you'd end up with is you'd end up annoying people because it's really annoying. Now, this is great for a la carte. It, it, it's really great in a situation where people, you, people want to buy things and it's absolutely hopeless for what people are moving to now. And when I left uh, Nokia as it was, it's now Microsoft, it's now going to be Line, which is a Korean messaging company, who knew? And um, uh, when I left there, everything was moving over to streaming again. So Spotify, Mix Radio. So Microsoft had Mix Radio, which is a a radio service where you could do recommendations, you could get playlists automatically, you'd put a seed artist in and it'd play, like Last FM, lots of music back. Um, hopeless for that, 
because very quickly you end up at Engelbert Humperdinck. You can't have that for a playlist. The playlist is dynamic, okay? It's like a radio station, it really is. If you think about the way radio stations work, is the license says you have to target these type of users. That's what the license says. You say to the licensing authority, we are going to target that demographic, and they go, you better, because if you don't, and you move off that, we're going to take your license away. So, uh, you know, th the way they work is by making sure that it's a consistent experience across all of the content that that demographic might like. And they do that in, a, in quite an interesting way, the way they program those, those services. So this wasn't a any good for that. And the reality is uh, that the way that you, you make it relevant, uh, a way a lot of people are making those relevant, is everything has gone back to curation again. There are a lot of teams of people curating content around themes. Well, when I first started, we used to pick Valentine's Day, Easter, Christmas, summer, Glastonbury, every single thing that happened had a theme we could tag it with and a bunch of tracks we could stick on it and that's how we got traffic to the door and interested people all our crm was pumping out these messages and we got traffic in and we converted it and we sold music and so now you've got a bunch of teams curating things and uh radio it really is like radio where you listen you put something in that you like and it plays you that which is just like your own personal radio station some of them are truly personalized, some of them aren't, they're still using aggregated data. But what we have to do, going back to what you said earlier about DSP, so uh, I used to work with Nokia Research a lot. One of the things that they did there was DSP. They did DSP on music files. And the uh, features that they extracted were fantastic. They could tell beats per minute, key, vocalist gender, mode, time signature, um, all sorts of all sorts of other things. Um, that, that process allows you to, to identify a piece of music. So you can say, that is like that. That's Shazam. So all of you who use Shazam, if you've ever heard of it, you hold your phone up and it tells you what the music is. All that's doing is say, I have a fingerprint of that file. I will listen to the music, do, an, do a, an analysis of the audio, match that fingerprint against the fingerprints in our catalog, and it's this track. And that's how they work. You can identify similar sounding music. So we ran the process on a subset of the catalog to try and find, go back to the 2080 rule, 80% 80 of that con content in any territory has not been transacted. The 80% is a different mix per territory, clearly. But, and what we could do is we could find music that sounded like music we liked, but no one had ever heard. And that was, that was amazing. But going back to that question about can you convince people to buy it, that's, we'll talk about that in a minute. So that was incredible. So you can, you can take out all of these particular metadata features from the analysis of a file, um, create your own tags, which the musicology team I had did. We also took Wikipedia data, Creative Commons data, perfectly entitled to do it, which has got factual data about musicians and bands. Uh, and it also had uh, deep links in the uh, text. If you look on the page and it's got links to other things, well, we worked out a way of turning those into tags as well. And it means that you can give each particular file a bag of data around it, and then you can go and say, let's have a look in that piece of music's bag of data. Is it the same as something similar to that piece of music's bag of data? And if you use that along with Bayes, again, probability, you end up with a really good playlisting system, and that's what they're using at the moment. So it's quite, quite interesting stuff. Um, well, yeah, what's going on? I talked a bit before about uh, analytics. Um, one of the first things that I can guarantee anyone will do when they go and build something, especially a music service, is forget that they need to report what's going on to everyone not just the business teams, but the user experience teams and the product teams and everyone else. It's the hardest thing to convince people to do is to get the hooks in early. Nowadays, you say it's easy because you've got Google Analytics, but big companies like Nokia don't want to use people like Google for their own reasons. So, um, but what they do have to do is get something, we used to say, wipe its face, build it, wipe its face, and shove it out the door get it in front of users, get people using it, get the revenue in, get the coverage you need, or the marketing uh, bump, whatever it is. So analytics was always a struggle. 
And uh, th now, dear Leonardo, he who loves practice without theory, you can read it. Uh, in my parlance, it's you have to have analytics in place in order to form your strategies. Here's something else I learned as well, uh, was I thought that was true. But the reason people do things and business team do things sometimes isn't logical. Uh, and it's valid. It's, it can be valid. But uh, uh, the VC of your company might have been told expressly by the board, you've got no knowledge of this, that they have a particular mission and it's not to put out the world's best music service. It's to do something else. And there's a good reason for it, there's a good business reason for it. You don't know that and you're struggling the whole time to make things work and get things working efficiently. And so sometimes you have to take a step back in this process when you're not getting the traction that you need and either give it up or try and understand. That was another process that I went through was my passion and what I thought was my objectivity didn't matter because it, <laughs> it was actually being driven by subjectivity and a completely different driver than having the world's best music service. And that's where, as I said, I have to take my passion and park it sometimes at the door and try and be objective and step back from the processes. But analytics told you some fun things. There's lots of interesting stuff we found out, like people who listen to dance music do it up until Wednesday and disappear until Sunday afternoon, listening to Chill Out. Where are they? I'll give you a guess. You can guess. Where are they on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday? At uh, club. Yeah, exactly. They're in the clubs. So it makes sense, doesn't it? One of the best things, the most fun things, we did a, 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 an exercise with an academic um, who looked at our data. It was to do with the World Cup. He wanted to see if pe what people listened to changed around the World Cup and we generated PR with it, and it was a great story. Uh, and there is a change in what people listen to around the World Cup. You'd be probably not surprised to listen to it. One, one of the things that threw up was, where, who's got the biggest problem with insomnia? Because, of course, we've got a timestamp as to when things are listened to. Guess? Oh. Sweden. <laughs> not bad, not bad. You think so. And I've been to Finland at midnight when it's like day, you know, so they have a problem there sleeping. But it was sweet. So many people were just up at two, three, four in the morning listening to music. We didn't know why, but that was quite interesting. So a bit of fun now. Let's go on to the mobile, the mobile experience. Um, you know, the amount of uh, sensors in a microphone have completely changed the way that we can do things, the way we do things in music, the way everything happens to you. Uh, now people are popping out ads as you move to things, move closer to, you know, if you go shopping down the street. With iBeacons now, these things are going to be like poking you and advertising things and giving you special offers. And it happens based on your real context, where you are right now. Um, I've done some really interesting, scary stuff, which I won't talk about with mobile phones uh, and research. But there's a, a few really basic ones that are, uh, are kind of interesting. Um, you, you, you can see what the sensors are in a mobile phone, and they can put more on. You can have apps that do all sorts of other things as well. With F Fitbit and these uh, sports things you can wear now, you can, you can do all sorts of uh, things, uh, um, uh, health, health uh, me medical stuff um, around, uh, around you and your, your activities. Um, and it's, uh, it's incredible. You know, uh, we, this is really true. You know, where, where, where and when people work, live, shop, eat, drive, walk, and cycle. If you're going 80 miles an hour, you are on a bike. And if you're doing more than seven or eight miles an hour, you're not walking. You might be running, but you'd have to be pretty good. So you'd know if they have children, their income bracket, demographic type interests, and holiday preferences, because you know where they fly, because they roam, so you can see which countries they go to. This is all just data that you can tell things about people and you can infer things about people as well. Some are facts, some are inferred. If they travel a lot or never travel, there's an interesting uh, um, exercise done in Japan on one particular town rather than city uh, that discovered that 90% of the population didn't go more than 10 miles outside of the radius of the city, more than a 10 mile radius outside the city. It's only 10% of the people flew, did business travel, etc., etc., did international travel. Uh, on any frequency. Um, you can tell their gender because if you look at their music, you can tell their gender, uh, who they communicate with, how they communicate with them, 
what media they like, when they go out, what they get up to, when they go to bed, what device they have, all the peripherals, what car they drive, what they buy petrol. This is the stuff you can do. Privacy was critical when we were designing a service like this and taking data in order to personalize the service. Because for me, I mean, I know this stuff, uh, it, it was quite scary. Uh, for people now, and they're just becoming aware of it with all of the things that are coming out in the news, people, the, the, the general population is becoming aware of all of this data. It's unbelievable the amount of data even your car throws off. I used to have a Land Rover Discovery, and I was reading the manual, and it said, by the way, we're capturing all of your telemetry, I suppose, all the data, everything that happens on the car, which way you're steering, uh, which way the wheels are turned, the speed, how fast you're braking, absolutely everything, so that in the event of a crash, we can take that data off and find out what actually happened. I didn't know that until I read that. That's what cars do. In the future, you know what cars is, what's going to happen is cars will be, they can do it now if you want to. You can send that data of exactly what's happening uh, to, uh, to some server somewhere. Um, fight that one, I would, but there we are. Going more basically though, context. So this is Seattle. These are artists from Seattle. And it meant that we as a music service could say, if you go to Seattle, or if you type in Seattle, we can give you a playlist of, if you're in Seattle, local music or artists that are from here. Uh, and so we, it gave us lots of ways of drawing out content that, were, that was relevant to people, um, or that we could just mine, data mining, to put features up, um, you know, Easter Bunny music, you just trawl for Easter Bunny music and you get all the Easter Bunny songs and you can make a feature out of that. So data mining became a de facto method of getting content out of the system that we could then merchandise um, uh, to, to get people in, to hook people in and convert them onto the store. It's also true that with a mobile phone especially, the Washington Monument now has a musical memory because I bet you there are loads of people who have been here and listened to music. Now that's location stamp, that music. It's on a server somewhere. So if you think about it, every single place you go now, you could actually say, play me here. If your friends have been there, you could say, play me what my friends listen to here. So this is the way that you think when you work with data a lot, is you're thinking constantly, how can we use this data to do things and create features that are going to engage people and keep them on the service? If you're at a stadium concert, if you're here, if you didn't know your friends were there, but you were connected through social networks, you could say, yeah, you've got three friends here. You want us to walk you to them. You could then use your mapping to walk you to, the, to your friends if you didn't know they were there. Nice, they're Finnish. They're great. So finding other people who like the same music uh, as you. You know, because of location and because we've got maps and because we've got directories of businesses and bars and restaurants and shops, is you know what's played, or you know what sort of music people who go to places play. So if you want to find a rock bar in a particular location, and you've got all the data, again, you can say, this is the place to go. If you like thrash metal, or math metal, or rock, or classic rock, we can take you to a place where the people there, let alone the venue, where the people there all like that music. There's no reason that you can't do that. It's all achievable. So. You know, it was, it's an amazing journey. I've been on an incredible journey. I have learned so much about data and what you can do with it. Uh, I have learned so much about uh, <laughs> the thought process in developing software. I've learned an awful lot about prioritization and uh, making a business work, but making it work uh, efficiently. Um, and I've also tried to answer that question that I asked back at the beginning. Can you sell music to people? Uh, who, um, uh, by playing the music that has not been bought in a particular territory. Well, if you think the chart in 1972 in week 14 was whatever it was, uh, there's a quality process that's gone on there. It's called people buying things that were good, and they defined it as good. And the one thing that I have found, very, very rarely broken, is that if you try and look in that 80% in any territory that hasn't been sold, you're really hard pushed to play them things that they will like. And there's two reasons for that. One, it's probably not very good. But the second thing is, and here's the important bit, and I'll go back to my passion to start with, 
is there's an emotional attachment with every piece of music that you like. There's a place that you listen to it first, an argument you had with your friends about whether it was good or bad. It was when you kissed your girlfriend the first time, et cetera, et cetera. And so that was the other thing that was true, is you realize that passion drives music, uh, the music business. People's passion drives the music business. Um, and so uh, praying, if you like, praying or using that passion is one of the ways that we used to sell music. We used what we knew people liked. We tried to find people's musical DNA to make sure that we were putting stuff in front of them that, that they would like all the time, keep coming back. That's what it's all about. You know, you get a big throughput of customers in those services. Millions of people come in, half a million drop out every million that come in. You have to keep that going. The only way you can do that is to play them stuff that's relevant. And that's what we tried to do. And that was my journey. Thank you. Um, 